Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Prevention of Blindness Society of Metropolitan Washington Tech Talk. We have a really great and engaging discussion today about the white cane and its many, many uses uh, towards getting us to independence. But before we get started, just a couple announcements for the Prevention of Blindness Society. First, uh, general announcement for you all. We now, as, as you all know, we do have services for our Low Vision Resource Center in Bethesda. We now are offering the same services on Mondays in Alexandria. So this is for people who maybe can't make it to Bethesda and you're interested in still getting the same services that we offer at uh, Bethesda. And we can provide these on Mondays. They are by appointment. And if you'd like to sign up, you can give our resource hotline a call. That number is 301-951-4444. Um, we've expanded this and we are expecting uh, high demand and we're excited about that. Uh, a couple other announcements. One, save the date for our next Being the Light Friends and Family Connection event. This will be our third iteration. We had one last May, we had one in December, and now we're having one on Saturday, June 10th. And it's going to be held at The View in Alexandria. Um, this is going to be a great time for you to bring your friends and family along. And what we're going to do, we're going to have a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Suleiman Alibi to discuss having that conversation when it comes to vision loss, as well as some everyday living tips. Uh, we're very, very excited about this program that's grown quite a bit over the past year and a half, and we're doing more and more of it because we want to make sure that we can serve not only yourself, but also can help out you with your friends and family. So again, save the date Saturday, June 10th. Additionally, on March 29th, we are having our next Low Vision Town Hall. Normally we have them on the third Wednesdays, but we are having a special one on the 29th where we're gonna be talking about leaving your legacy. Now, when some of you all hear legacy leaving, you automatically think, well, that means that we're gonna be asking for money. That's not what we're doing. We're gonna be talking about not just the financial side, but especially more about what you want to leave behind to your friends and family members, whether that and how you want to be remembered, whether that be old knickknacks that you have or memorabilia that you have, or something that makes them remind that, um, them of you. Maybe you, you, you fished with your um, grandson frequently, so you have your old tackle box and you want to bring it behind. Uh, or maybe you quilted with a granddaughter and you want to be able to leave those behind to them. And just thinking about how you can leave behind um, your legacy with people and your memories with people. Uh, so we're really excited about this. It's a different subject than we normally do, but it is definitely related. Uh, and it's also a chance for you to um, raise awareness about vision problems too with your family. Uh, so again, save the date, March 29th at 11 a.m. All right, without further ado, we are now going to pass the mic. Today, we are having a special presentation on the white cane, which is a useful tool for independence. And many people don't know, there are multiple kinds of white canes, and they have different uses and purposes. So we are joined today by Ms. Sharon Payne, who is a Certified Orientation and Mobility Specialist, a COMS, as well as a certified low vision therapist, a CLVT. Sharon has more than 30 years of experience in the field and has been serving in Maryland and DC for as long as I can remember. And she's very, very well known. If you've ever had white cane training in the, in, you're from Maryland, there's a pretty good chance you may know Sharon. Uh, so Sharon's gonna share a little bit about that. And she also has Dorlin joining us today. Dorlin is, not only a white cane user and a, um, a uh, student of Sharon, but she also teaches Braille to people. So Dorlin, thank you for joining us as well, because we're going to learn not just about your firsthand accounts of using the white cane, but we're also going to learn a little bit about Braille too. So uh, Sharon, I'm going to pass the mic over to you. Okay, thank you, Sean. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, everybody. Familiar and not, although I think there are more familiars than, than not on here. Um, uh, welcome to the very first one of these that I have done as a telecommuter. Some of you may know me from previous times in Virginia or at one of the other um, um, support groups that Janet used to, um, used to run for us. 
Um, so we're going to be talking about the white cane today. I have been teaching white cane skills now for 35 years. I learned to get excited about the white cane because my babysitter was totally blind. So she's been using a cane most of her life, uh, getting around, reading books in braille, and showing people that just because you don't have vision in your eyes doesn't mean that you don't have vision around you. And so without further ado, I'm first going to introduce Dorlin Catron. And Dorlin learned to use a cane. She's going to tell you all about that. A dog guide. And she is also a techie person, salute to that, um, who uses travel apps to know where she is. So not only mobility, but also orientation. So orientation and mobility. Dorlin, I have to tell you that with Sean's wonderful accent in the um, closed captioning, you're coming up as Darlin. So I would agree with that. <laughs> uh, let me introduce you and let you take the mic to get started with your story. Very cool. Well, thank you, Sharon. And thank you, Sean, for having us. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, like they said, my name is Dorlin, Dorlin Catron. Uh, I live in Laurel, Maryland now. Uh, I'm originally from Colorado, but I've lived in the D.C. area for about the last 20 years. Um, Let's see, I am, just for everyone who can't see, um, since some folks have their uh, video on, I'll give a brief description of myself. I'm a white woman with medium brown hair pulled back into a ponytail today. I have a headset on with a boom mic so that you guys don't have to hear my horrible computer audio. <laughs> I've got a, a darkish purple sweater on and a silver necklace that says JDX in Braille, which stands for just do it. So <laughs> with that, I'll uh, jump into uh, my story a little bit. Uh, I lost my sight nine years ago from diabetic retinopathy. I've been a type one diabetic since I was 12 and uh, finally caught up with me. I have a slight bit of light perception left, so I'm a little bit like a moth. I can go towards the light, which is very helpful in metro uh, stations and other places. And then I've been a cane user since 2014, which is when I lost my sight. And then I've been a guide dog user since the end of 2017. I have a black Labrador retriever named Tank. He hails from Guide Dogs for the Blind out of San Rafael, California. Um, and a couple other things about me were already mentioned. I do um, facilitate several Braille groups on the American Council of the Blinds Community Calls platform. So if anyone's uh, on those, you can always pop in. We are there on Saturdays doing a weekend Braille together, uh, which is a general session. Then we have breakout rooms on Sundays and Tuesdays where people work on specific skills. We also do a calendar event where we get our get a feel for the month and. Uh, we're starting to do some reading in Braille on Zoom too, so that's cool. Uh, I'm pursuing my uh, certification or certificate in Braille transcribing through the National Library Service currently. I'm about uh, three quarters of the way through that course. And uh, I'm also a volunteer tutor for the DC Public Library on VoiceOver. That's uh, a little bit about me in general. And then um, I've got my cane story here. If I should go ahead and jump into that, Sharon, or if there was me something too. else. No, that's what we want to hear. All, all, right. The cane. all right, let's do it. So um, I, like I said, I lost my sight in 2014. When I was losing my sight, I actually went out to Oregon to stay with my little sister and got a little bit of training through the Oregon Commission for the Blind. Um, they're pretty spread out there in Oregon, though. So I didn't get a lot of... Um, contact with a mobility instructor, but one day they did get me a cane and show me how to swing that thing back and forth properly and identify a door and move up to a door, also identify stairs, how to go up and down stairs, and how to find a curb and kind of figure out where you're on the curb. And this all happened in about 30 minutes, and it was my very first and only introduction to the cane for several months. Um, and then uh, they sent me home with that cane. And I remember walking home with it and being really shocked by how much noise was coming um, back from the sidewalk with the cane. Um, and now I've realized that that noise isn't noise, it's information. It's amazing. I actually, 
um, when I first got Tank and was using a guide dog, I really missed that audio feedback I got from the cane. And I didn't always take the cane with me when I first started. I was like, well, am I going to need it? I still had a little bit of vision. I didn't necessarily want to be out there with it. It felt awkward to have around. But really now it's, it's the MasterCard. You know, you don't leave home without it. Um, it's wonderful for identification of all sorts of things, including myself to the world as someone who is visually impaired, which when I still had some sight was really important to me just because you can look a little bit out of place when you have a visual impairment and people don't realize what's going on, but you have that cane and people automatically identify, oh, they're having trouble seeing and they know how to present assistance. Well, sometimes they do, or at least they understand what's going on and you're not just a crazy person in the street. Um, and so I've really, I've embraced the tools at this point. I would really encourage everyone to embrace the cane. It, it's made my life so much easier since I did embrace it. Uh, so my current cane, I call Pete the Fourth uh, because he is Pete the Fourth. Pete the First uh, met his dis demise by me banging it into things over months and months. Pete two and three were taken down by some sighted people trying to avoid us. Um, but that's all right. We've got Pete the fourth now and he's been doing great. I use a ceramic tip on that, which provides me with a lot of audio feedback. I really like that tip. I know Sharon's going to describe a whole bunch of tips and cane types. Uh, Pete the fourth is an Ambutech folding cane though. He folds into six uh, different sections. And I take him now, even when I have the uh, guide dog, I keep him in my backpack or in whatever bag I have so that if we come to an obstacle where for some reason my guide dog isn't able to get us around it and I can't figure out what's going on, I can whip out that cane and get whatever information I need for myself. Um, it's also helpful if Tank needs to be off duty for some reason. Uh, we attended a conference last weekend. We're at a hotel and I have to take him out to the the tree box to relieve. And so having the cone or the um, the cane right around there was great. Being able to identify where that tree box was so I wasn't tripping while he was doing his business and wasn't working. And then identifying that trash can uh, to make the deposit. Uh, canes are great for identifying trash cans. I hate having to touch that stuff. It's much easier to bump in with the cane. Same with other gross things like finding toilets and such. So it's it's just a great tool for gross things too. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? Um, and that's basically it. I was using uh, Pete the Fourth this morning even. I got an order delivered from Instacart and needed to go out and find where it was. And so I was able to go out and bump around and kind of swing in that cane back and forth instead of possibly tripping over my groceries or stepping on something. So uh, Pete's gotten some work today already. Uh, let's see. Oh, one other thing I have here is that the change in surface check texture uh, with the cane is so much more apparent than with just your feet, especially depending on how much feeling you might have in your feet. I'm a diabetic, as I said, I've got some neuropathy in them. Um, and depending on what shoes you wear, you might not get that much feedback either, but that cane is going to give you that feedback. And that texture change can often be a really valuable landmark for where you're at. Um, so I, I really love the cane for that because that's something I don't always pick up with the dog. I, I certainly uh, trust the dog to take me wherever I need to go or, or me to give him instructions and us to get where we need to go. Um, but I don't necessarily notice the textures as much as I did with the cane. Um, and then my personal uh, mantra when I'm out there with the cane, I'm going to share with everyone. I hope we've got some uh, Finding Nemo or Finding Dory fans out there. Um, in the original Finding Nemo movie, Dory the bluefish, the forgetful bluefish, when she wasn't you know, sure what was going on, her mantra was just keep swimming. And so when I'm out there in the world, especially before I got the guide dog and was just getting used to the cane, my mantra was just keep swinging. You keep that cane going back and forth. You're going to find what you need. You're going to get where you need to go. Um, and uh, 
I've gotten some good instruction from Sharon Payne here, as well as a couple other mobility instructors. And I'm just very grateful for all of their help and that training to be able to utilize this tool. And then uh, my apps that I use when I'm out and about, I like to use BlindSquare. Uh, that one is one you have to pay for, unfortunately, but it's, I believe it's still $29.99 in the App Store. It might have gone up by $5, but it's a one-time fee, and I paid it years ago, and I have not regretted it. It allows me, well, so BlindSquare takes Foursquare and data from Google Maps and combines them and helps you figure out where when you're approaching curbs and intersections, what intersections they are, it'll identify different businesses and points of interest around you as well. So that one's really great. I'll just turn that one when I'm out and about. I've also started using Soundscapes, which is free, and that's awesome. And it's something where you can actually set up your own markers within that app. So if you know an, a route you're doing or maybe um, you're planning a new route and you have someone helping you with it, they can help you do that too. Set some markers and then you've got your route specifically set and you'll get audio feedback as you're going through the route. So that one's Soundscape. And then of course, I, I have an iPhone. I believe both of those apps are available for both iPhone and Android. They're both definitely available for iPhone. And then if you have an iPhone, I use Siri sometimes. Hey Siri, where am I? If you get out, if you're out and about and you're not quite sure where you are, she'll tell you what address you're at. And if you have an idea of where you're at in the world to begin with, you can kind of say, oh, that's where I went wrong. Oh, that's where I am. So um, just the basic where am I function on the iPhone is great too. And that is basically all my notes for what I wanted to share to begin with. And I'm happy to answer any questions and contribute however you'd like as we go forward, Sharon. But with that, I think I'll turn it over to you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So before we go any further, does anybody have any questions direct to, directly for Dorlin about her experiences, travels, getting started, <clears throat> like that? I, I have a question. This is Mina. Um, I use uh, one of the applications called Lazarillo that I, it, it gets me to um, anywhere I am, it will tell me. So it was wonderful in the iPhone. Oh, that's great. Which app did you say that was? Lazarillo. Lazarillo. It's yes. L-A-Z. Uh, yeah, hold on one second. I <laughs> have it right here. Uh, hold on. And it works anywhere in the in the world because I was in Mexico a week ago and it works over there too. It gets me through uh, anywhere that I am in the in the world. Oh, you very know? cool! And it goes Lazarillo. So L A Z A R I L L, like in yeah, it's and it's it pronounced like a Y and then O. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it talks. It talks and let you know where, exactly where you are. Very cool. I'll look that up. Thank you so much. You are on three hundred. You see, Taylor it talks. Street, Northeast Washington DC twenty thousand seventeen. Oh, cool. One hundred Gallatin Street, NE one point three <laughs> kilometers. And it tell you west. which the other street and whatever you are. It will it will walk with you and let you know where you are. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that and, it works, uh, and it works in, in any country. That's great. Yeah, I have no idea if the apps I talked about work uh, abroad. I think Soundscape does. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure, though, but that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Good. Any other comments or questions? Okay. And just so everyone knows, if you want to ask a question, unmute yourself. There's a microphone button at the bottom left of your screen, you can also press Alt plus the letter A. If you're on a phone, it is star six. Okay, so we can talk a little bit about um, the specific history of the cane itself. Why is the cane white and where did it come from? So for many, many centuries, people who have vision problems have used a walking staff of some sort to be able to feel around in front of them. And 
the um, the future of cane seems to be something similar as we um, work into the the newest cane that I've seen, and I will talk to you a little bit about that um, in a minute. Um, but the few, the history of the white cane, as we see, it goes back to about the 1930s. If you remember, after World War One, especially with all the mustard gas and uh, and explosions and things like that. Um, there were a lot of soldiers that returned with eye damage. And at that time, still, um, cataract surgery was something new. They didn't have these little foldable lenses they could put in and go out um, the next day and start walking around. You were bed bound for three uh, weeks, waiting for your eye to heal because they had to cut this big open, um, open up. Uh, opening in your eye to put the, the glass lens in. Now that they're plastic and they can fold them, they can fit in a lot um, more easily. So the eye conditions were uh, more prevalent that could not be healed. Obviously, there was no diabetic eye surgeries back in that time with the lasers and things like that. So people would take whatever they had and start walking around. And in the 1930s, a lion recognized that somebody was trying to stop the growing amount of traffic so he could get across the street with a black cane and nobody was looking at it, nobody was paying any attention to it. And he and the Lions Clubs began um, a movement to hand out what were then support canes painted white and try to, in Illinois first, get people to recognize that the white cane identified somebody with a vision problem so that people would give way. And slowly that's become the law across the entire United States. Now, the white on a cane is made of the same reflective material as stop signs, and we know how good that people are at stopping at every corner at a complete stop. Yes, that was sarcasm. So the cane is meant to help you to add a layer of protection. If you walk out into the street without a cane, 80% of the time you won't get hit anyway. People will avoid you, they'll come to a screeching halt, they'll slow down, whatever it takes. The use of a white cane adds another couple of percentages onto that to push it up over 90% protected. And then of course, if there is an accident, it's up to, um, up to the person who has had that problem to um, take it up in the courts and say that this person did not, um, you know, give way as the law demands. So what does the cane do? It does two main things. Um, the first thing it does is it provides the person who's using it with lots of information. So we never want to stop a blind person from hitting a pole with their cane because that may be the pole they're looking for. Um, it also, as Dorlin so well um, said, it gives us echoes. We know when the building ends because the echoes change. We know when there's an awning because the echoes change. We know when we're walking in front of a window instead of a cement building because an echo is, um, is changing. So every one of those makes for some sort of change in your environment. Auditory, tactile, when your cane is hitting, something different, it feels different when it goes down a curb, and it will give you that information um, if, of your surrounding um, areas, if there's a pole or a bench or um, a tripping hazard, such as one of those parking blocks, we wanna stop when we get to those and not trip over them. So the question is, what is the other thing it does? The other thing it does is, um, Sorry, <laughs> something came up in the front of, middle of my screen. I lost you guys. Um, so the other thing that it does is it tells other people that we have a vision problem. One of the things that Dorlin said, if you're in a grocery store and you have low vision and you turn around and you say to the person walking up to you, excuse me, where's the mustard? You know, and they're like, why is a stupid person asking me where's the mustard? It's right there next to them. When you're carrying a white cane, it says to the person, oh, that person's not going to see that mustard. And they might even tell you what kind it is if you ask. So it provides identification to drivers. It's reflective, adds to your safety. And when you're doing your shopping or going about, if you want assistance, it makes it clearer to people why you're asking them or why you're standing on the corner going, hello, anyone there? You know, can I cross with you? Um, they don't know why you're talking to yourself, but if you have your cane, then it makes it clearer. 
Um, some people are very concerned about touching or tapping other people with a cane. But in most instances, people don't mind getting touched with or tapped with a cane. If um, you're in the store and you tap somebody in the back, and even if they initially don't know why you're you know, touching their legs and they turn around, it's like, why are you touch? Oh, sorry, can I help you with something, right? It changes the attitude because they know that that, that is how you see how you know where they are and how you avoid running into them or pushing them over. So in general, that's a very helpful um, thing for, uh, for them. The cane techniques that we use were developed by Richard Hoover, Dr. Richard Hoover, after World War II, when we had again, soldiers returning from war in their young ages, 20s and 30s sometimes, and saying, look, I can't see anymore, but I'm refusing to sit on a couch for the next 20, 30, 50 years of my life. I need to do something. And Dr. Hoover said, okay, so we have this white support cane, but you know, feeling along makes it look like Mr. Magoo. Nobody wants to do that. People want to stand up. They want their heads up. If they have remaining vision, they want to be using it. They want their shoulders back and to feel like um, a valuable part of our society. Leaning over a little tiny support cane doesn't do it and it doesn't find all the obstacles. And so Dr. Hoover created the Hoover method and the two-point touch technique that we often see in movies. We've now got about seven different techniques that we use for stairs and for walking around and for finding doors and things like that. But the original techniques were created by Dr. Hoover. And if you're here in Baltimore with me, you might even have heard of the Hoover Low Vision Center um, located at GBMC. So that was um, created in, in Dr. Hoover's name. He was an ophthalmologist uh, to start with who worked with the VA. That technique is about um, two steps in front of where you're walking. People say, well, why does the cane have to be that long? The cane has to be that long because the first step that you take after your cane comes in contact with something, you almost can't stop. So the cane is going to touch something. You're going to take the step you were in the middle of, and then you have one more step to come up to where your cane is now standing straight up and down, telling you that this is a step up, this is a step down, this is the door, a pole, whatever it is, and you can maneuver around those obstacles. And that's why the cane is called the long cane. It's not a support cane for leaning on. It is a, um, <laughs> it is a long cane meant as a probe to find out what is out there. Now, some of the new canes and new cane tips allow you to do both. They allow you to probe and to kind of use it for balance or hiking. And we're going to be talking about that as well. Now, some people have a hard time holding on to a cane or moving it side to side, especially if you've had a stroke or something else, MS, uh, muscular dystrophy, things that interfere with the muscles in your body and the ability to move that cane safely wider than your shoulders. Because we not only want to find the poles that the signs are on, but we want to find the sign that's on that pole. And we want to make sure that the cane's going to hit the pole under the sign and tell us to move around it and not hit our faces onto that um, sign or whatever it might be. In orientation, which is the other half of orientation and mobility, in orientation, we want to know where are we? Where are we going? The address where we're at, the place that we're going and how we get there. Um, Dorlin and I have laughed is that, you, you know, you usually don't take an airplane to get from here to the grocery store, but it's a really good way to get back to Colorado. And you usually don't walk to Colorado, although some people have hiked cross country, right? You don't usually walk to Colorado, you're gonna take an airplane. So orientation is knowing where you are, how you're gonna travel and which, maybe which cane you're going to use. The white cane can be, with all its different styles, very much like a pair of shoes. Some people will wear sneakers and some people will wear dress shoes. So you might pick a very light cane to take to a party and when you're all dressed up and you can put a little bling on the handle if you want to. And you can, you know, wear sneakers or, or hiking boots to, you know, hike to Colorado if you'd like. I'm going with you next time, Jorlin. So we, um, we have different, different kinds of canes, different kinds of cane tips. Um, I'm going to be showing those of you who can see them. And we are, um, we are 
hopefully at some point going to get back together again in person. I'll be able to do this um, in person. But for now, I have a bag with a whole bunch of canes and cane tips in it. I'm going to start with a couple of the most familiar canes that we have. The very lightest cane is called an ID cane, and it kind of is going in and out here. So let me see. You need to turn off your background. That's what exactly what I was doing. Um, choose video. Okay, none. Let's see how this works. There you go. You can see I love books. Wonderful. Okay, there we go. So the oh, ID that's cane. That's not an embarrassing uh, background to have there in a normal office anyway. You don't need a yeah. fake background. So the ID cane is very light. I'm holding it up here in front of you. It has red on the bottom, this one. Okay. And at the top, it doesn't have a regular grip that you would have to hold on to if you were moving the cane back and forth all day long. So it's just a very lightweight. And this is just for identification. You can get them in a folding style or a non-folding style. It doesn't matter. This is a straight, straight identification cane. And the idea is that you hold it out in front of you and let people know at a party or things like that, you know, I'm next in line for the bathroom. I'm not going to make eye contact with you. I'm not going to be able to tell you that that's what I'm doing. A lot of the new canes are folding canes. And so they have, a, there we go, they have elastic that goes right down the center and hinges, which we don't put our fingers in. There we go. And so if I fold it, <laughs> thanks, Thrillin, appreciate that. So you can fold your cane and take the end of the elastic that goes all the way through to the bottom, put it over. Um, there are some nice new holders out that you can put your cane in on your belt. You can put it in your bag. You can fold the canes. The more folding you do, obviously, the more rattling you're gonna get at the hinges. If you have low vision, it may not be as important. If you have no vision, you may want a more rigid cane like I was showing you that doesn't fold. And you get all of the information, all the vibration from the tip comes right up to your grip, right up to your hand. Okay, so that is the cane. This cane, these canes used to be made of aluminum and it was just a piece of aluminum pipe. And then we put a little hook at the top. We put a tip, a pencil tip at the bottom and we were ready to go. Now we've kind of got a whole bunch of fancy canes. So I'm going to show you as many of these as I can. This is made by Ambutech. This is no longer made of aluminum, though you can buy those. They're cheaper, but they're also heavier. Um, we have graphite canes now that are much, much, um, much, much lighter. And again, you can get those in a straight cane. All right, and there we go. Or a folding cane. The kinds of tips that we have, the pencil grip is just, it looks just like a pencil. So it's just white and plain. And the other major kind of thing that we have is a white support cane. So for people who use a support cane and don't want to give up that sense of stability, you might use a cane that is for support and you just maybe need to check things. Sometimes we see a shadow and we're not sure, is it a shadow? Is it a pool of water or is it a real drop down hole? It's just not quite clear. And so we can use the support cane to check that, but we don't wanna be um, using that if we can't see what's out there in front to be checked. So the support cane can be very helpful. I have a lot of diabetic clients and people who have had strokes that use both canes. They use a support cane in one hand for support because neuropathy can be a bear and you can lose that feeling in your feet and not be able to tell what's going on on the ground and lose your balance really easily. And so if you don't know what's coming up, that makes it twice as dangerous. So we use a long cane in front as the probe to tell us what's happening. And then we use the support cane to make sure we don't lose our balance when we're taking that step up or step down or step over the parking block. It gives us both. Now, some people have a hard time moving the cane back and forth. This cane tip goes across the bottom. It also hooks onto your long white cane. And this bar rolls on bicycle tires, little tiny bicycle tires, fits in my hand. 
All right, so it's maybe about three inches of, around on either side. And I could just push this forward and anything big enough to trip me will, um, will be stopped by the bar. So I don't need to move the cane from side to side. I can push my cane, which is attached here. I can just push my cane and make sure that anything that is dangerous uh, I'm warned about. And of course, if it's a step down, it will warn me about those as well. So that's not used very often, but occasionally it really allows people a lot of freedom. Um, it's better than using a big heavy walker because if you're using a walker and you can't see what's there, if you go down the driveway on one side, um, the walker can tilt tip over and that can be very, very dangerous. So we don't want anybody to, um, to lose their uh, balance. So going back to kind of one of the newest canes, I don't have the actual cane with me right now. I returned my beta vision, uh, version because next week I'm getting a new one. There's the all-terrain cane. And the all-terrain cane um, was actually created um, by a person who is severely visually impaired from RP, who lives in Sedona, Arizona. So he's called Sedona Dave. And he leads hiking trips. If you want to see some beautiful pictures, he leads hiking trips in Sedona, Arizona. And he has a Facebook page and a werewolf is his um, other page. And his cane is going to have something similar to the tip I'm gonna show you next, which is called a ball tip. There we go, looks just like a ball. And allows also, because the cane is longer than usual and adjustable, you can use it for hiking and walking next to you, or you can use it moving back and forth in front of you. And it has been kind of a, a hit with people that are long distance hikers. I can't wait to try out the new one. There are tips that are flat on the bottom. So for those people that just need a little bit of help when they're making a transition, you can have a rolling tip that will give you the information about what's happening in front of you. It's lighter than the ball, but it's also flat on the bottom. So if you think about holding that cane and getting a little bit of balance as you step down or up big curbs, this can be very, very helpful to you. There it is, and while I get it, okay. I don't wanna leave anybody out here. The OmniSense right here is similar to the ball. It's lighter in weight. It rolls forward and back and side to side. So whereas the ball has one way of rolling, this one actually has two different directions that it rolls on. This is one tip, even though it looks like it's two parts, two sides. This is one cane tip and it's hooked onto the edge of the, the bottom of the cane there. Right over here, it has like a little bicycle stand on one side and can roll like that. So the OmniSense is another long distance, um, lots of walking um, cane. And then I have... So, so normally uh, you kind of, you, you kind of uh, poke or scrape the, the tip or something. I don't, I don't know how to use them, but that's what it looks like. And Say so what, why, why do you, what's the uh, advantage of like that multi-axis uh, rolling one? So it's lighter than the ball. A lot of people like the idea of the ball tip, but the problem with the balls is they tend to be heavy. And if you're tall, you can imagine a five foot cane with a ball at the end of it, um, like a pendulum. It's heavy, it kind of throws itself. And um, some people don't like that, um, like that weight. The sound um, is also very, very different. You get actually a lot of sound uh, echo location from uh, the OmniSense that you don't get from the ball. The ball doesn't give you a lot of sound feedback at all. So if you're a person who's used to using, let's say a, a touch technique and you're tapping and you're listening for echoes and then your balance isn't so good and you're going to a ball technique, uh, to a ball tip, then you would appreciate having um, the durability of a ball, the size of the ball because it'll go over um, those smaller things that can get in your way. Um, some people really like the sound that it makes um, when you have to walk, this is my Alexandria people, right? That have to walk on brick sidewalks. So if you have cobblestones in the streets or on the sidewalk, some people really appreciate um, being able to get over those a little bit more easily. Did that um, answer your question? Oh, I, I think I understand 
now with the cobblestone example, mm -hmm. what, what the whole point of of those are. It's a it's it's more of a surface area. You can all, all those all those things sticking up, the, the, the different stones sticking up next to each other, and whatever you can right. you can kind of drive over that with the thing a little bit and get an idea that that's and as so that's the idea. If right. That's the idea of the rolling you, ball you and the rolling marshmallow is to go over the smaller stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, cobblestones is just a, a really good local example that we have. Um, but not everybody has good sidewalks. And some people have to walk in the street where they live. Um, if they're in a more rural area, there aren't sidewalks to walk on at all. So the smaller tips will get, you know, stuck more often unless you have a very light, light touch. So um, people who you, you know want to want to use an Ambutex style cane um, and not something like a fiberglass cane, which is very very light to start with, um, will will want a tip that's going to be able to go over um, uh, the obstacles in their way. So we have. I'm um, just give me half a second here, Sharon. While you're doing that, this is Sandy. Is the is the Omni tip intended to be swinging back side to side? Yes, it has rollers in both directions. I can't wait to come down, Sandy, and do this in person in your group and everybody can feel one. So. <laughs> um, can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oops, can you hear me now? I unmuted. Yes. Um, I, I have a white. As best as I should. I have a big ball at the bottom. But my problem is mostly depth perception and contrast. So I don't see the delineation between steps. I have a feeling, um, I haven't used it that much, that that's not going to help me with steps because you're going from side to side. Is that correct? And is there a cane that is best to help you feel a step in front of you? So it, that when that comes, I always tell people there's two things that we adapt with, techniques and technology. So the cane is not a stick. It's not something you pick up from the front yard and, you know, and start swinging around. As I said, there are seven different cane techniques and using those different techniques with the cane allows you to find steps no matter what the tip is on your cane. So um, depending on where you walk, you might appreciate one of the other one of the other cane tips. And I'm going to talk about those in, um, in a second. I have one more kind of cane I wanted to show people, another adapted cane. So the top of it, it's kind of cool, this one actually pivots. So the top of it, when you're learning, you, again, don't have to um, move this one side to side. And we start with a lot of the kids like this that don't have the motor control. So we grab it by either side and then their hands can come together to where there's a central handle that they can hold like a regular cane and just push that forward. And for some people, I have used this in like nursing homes and things like that, um, where there aren't any steps to be worried about and just make sure that they don't bump into anybody or anybody's walker or hurt themselves on the you know feet of wheelchairs that are sticking out. So if you can't see it, that's a... It's a, it's a frame. It's a lot like uh, uh, some of the uh, grocery cart uh, uh, little the rectangle of PVC. Yeah, it's around. a rectangle of PVC plastic. And it sits on the, the whole bottom of that rectangle sits on the ground. The whole top of it, you can put your hands on <laughs> like the handles of a shopping cart. Yes. Um, and push it and push it forward. So that was a great, uh, great description. Whoever filled that in for me, much appreciated. So the kinds of tips we have, we talked a little bit about the um, OmniSense. We talked a little bit about the ball, the ball tip tips that we have. We have rolling marshmallow tips. So this one's a little bit smaller than the ball tip. And then we have um, a marshmallow, which is even a little bit smaller than this, which is um, not moving, not rolling. We use that more as a touch technique or just gently on the ground. There is also the pencil tip that I mentioned that we started with at the very beginning. Not so many people use those anymore. And then there are the two, the metal tip and the ceramic tip that give you ex excellent location. Um, 
And so these, when you tap them, take it off the end here. When you tap them, you're getting good echoes. The one that goes on the bottom of the NFB canes, the very light canes, is made of metal. And some people don't like the way that they stick into um, things because they're flat at the bottom. And the newest one from Ambutech, which I like, is called the ceramic tip. And the ceramic tip puts out a very similar echo, but the nice thing about it is it's rounded at the bottom so it catches on things a lot less. It gives you good echo, gives you good tactile feedback as to what's there in front of you, whether it's the edge of the step or any obstacle in front of you, and allows you to, to do that. Um, the support canes don't have such a choice, but if you ever hear somebody using a cane and you hear it rattling, you see I have a brand new tip on this one, it shouldn't rattle. The rattling comes when the rubber at the bottom gets worn out. So do your friend a favor and uh, go to Walgreens or something, get them a new one. <laughs> They're not very expensive. They're pretty easy to find and we'll make sure that that person is safer because their cane will be gripping the ground as opposed to part, part of the metal showing and then wearing it out, which is not, not very helpful. So, um, excellent. So are there any questions about canes or travel apps or anything else that has to do with orientation and mobility? We are at your service. This is Shri. Shri? Yeah, I had two questions. Uh, first one, um, what, what are your thoughts on the smart canes? And my second question is, is there any... Um, Etiquette with when you swing the cane, because occasionally when I'm walking with my wife, I'm in the mall, I may accidentally bang into a glass and I feel bad uh, because I hit it hard when I'm swinging. So is there some etiquette behind that or no? So you should be in charge of your cane. Your cane shouldn't be in charge of you. So um, again, it comes back to technique. So did have you had um, orientation mobility training with an instructor? Uh, I had uh, on the job myself training um, on the cane. So I would say I took some classes, but I wouldn't say I am anywhere close to that. Okay. So there's some great, if people want to look up Mike Mulligan, remember Mike Mulligan and the steam shovel? So Mike Mulligan is the name of an orientation and mobility specialist. He's a certified comms, as, as I am myself, um, who has made a series of videos on all of the different I think all of the different cane techniques and some of the orientation techniques. And he's made an excellent one on what you should know before you go traveling in that airport. Um, so uh, if you wanna look up Mike Mulligan's videos on technique, um, or if you wanna get some training, you know, if you're still working um, or you're over 55, you have the easier time getting training. And then there's other agencies that can sometimes provide other um, private um, instruction if necessary. And can I insert um, something here? It's Dorlin. Um, if you're Shri, uh, I think for me, I felt really weird at first when I would hit into something like that, something that made noise in a public place or like running into a car that was too far into an intersection. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm hitting their car with my cane. I felt bad. But it's something that I think you just have to kind of get over, you know, and know that this cane isn't really going to hurt anything out in the world. It's for you to identify things. And the people that don't understand that, you know, they're not what's important. The information to you is important, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And what, what are your thoughts on the smart canes? You know, me personally, I think I'm old school. I think I'd prefer to put a few tools in my toolbox together, which I kind of think essentially a smart cane is, is kind of a GPS app plus a cane, maybe some sensors. I don't know for sure, but I think I, I, I like the putting it together myself with having my good cane technique, I don't have to worry about my cane's battery dying, I guess, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. So maybe I'm a little old school and I so haven't gotten to try one out. So maybe my tune will change. But for now, I like having an app on my phone and having my uh, analog cane. I like that. that I think Dorlin said it also. I'm going to stop right there. Um, if you have... Um, no, I am gonna add one more thing. If you lose your cane, if your cane breaks, you've just lost both. 
if it's a combined thing yeah if it's a combined thing if it's not combined then you still have one without the other um and you know i've had clients that have had like their cane stolen out of their shopping carts and while that's annoying when the cane is fifty dollars you know a five hundred dollar loss is a lot lot worse so um yeah i, I definitely go, uh, agree with Dorlin. yeah you probably learned it from me i, I have a question um one sec, Chris. Joe's had his hand raised for a little while. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, Go ahead, Joe. I'll, yeah, I'll be real quick. It's Joe Awkward, uh, longtime cane traveler, work with POB. Uh, just three quick things. Um, so when we get calls, people say, where do I buy a cane? I just want to verify that we're, we're doing the right thing. I almost, I tell them, best thing to do, go for an O&M instructor and have a cane set up for you other than the ID cane, because, you know, the size and things like that. So I just wanted to verify that. And then I guess, secondly, talking about the cane, personally, I agree what we're saying here, hearing it, and even if it's tapping on the side or something, I think that's a good thing. And I always say, if it hits, that's the cane hitting it, you know, not your knee or not your, <laughs> your elbow or your face, you know, so I think that's a good thing. And like you say, it, it, it's information. And I guess the last one, Sharon, and there, you know, obviously with low vision, there, there's a, a whole emotional part of carrying a cane. And, yeah. you know, we encourage others, you know, because it is a tool of independence um, and it is a way of, of being known. And I just don't know if you have any tips out there for folks who, who may want to take that step or something they could, you know, to encourage folks to consider. That is an excellent, excellent um, point to bring up, Joe. Right. Um, a lot of people, when they get their first canes, will go with their instructors to an area that's not right by their home. Nobody wants to fumble and feel uncomfortable in front yes. of people that you know. And so right. taking Makes your sense. cane on vacation, taking your cane to a dark theater where you're going to see a movie with the family and things like that, mm -hmm. start wherever you're comfortable. Um, as far as where should people get a cane, um, the preferred idea is, yes, get some training um, first, because I've seen some really cheap canes on the internet nowadays that have like a rubber tip on them, like you can't use it on the ground. I don't know why um, why people um, do that, except I think what they're doing is they're turning it more into a walking stick. It's got the mm -hmm. same kind of base as a, as a hiking pole. I see. And so that's, sure. you know, an identifier, just like right. the wood support cane is an identifier to a certain extent, but right. it doesn't, the main thing, the cane is there to help you find things right so you need to find the poles you need to find the step offs you need to find those parking blocks and those shopping center you know right. parking lots and things like that so yes if they can that's great mm -hmm. um if not you know you can always tell them to give it give us a call you know sure. we'll help them to to get the right uh, the right size uh, okay with them and oftentimes people choose one size cane when they start and a longer cane as they gain that confidence as you're walking faster you need a longer cane because it's fit not only to your height but also to your gait how fast do you walk i just started a man six inches taller than i am and today he started with the same size cane i'm using why because he walks very slowly takes very very small steps mm -hmm. But I know, I know once he starts gaining confidence, his mm -hmm. cane is probably going to go up by two inches and four inches and, and likely by six inches right. uh, from his from his speed. And the nice thing about a longer cane, you can reach out to find things like a pole that might be on the grass if you, yes. need, you need to turn when you get to the pole. Yes. You can always shorten up on a longer cane. Right. You can True. always put your hand further down the cane shaft to make it shorter. If you're a party, it's crowded. There's a lot of people in airport, things like that. You can never make a too short cane any longer than it is. Yeah. So the all-terrain cane now that's coming out, a lot of people, when they use it for all different kinds of hobbies and hiking and walking and cities and all that, um, can adjust it to yeah. what they're using it for. So that's kind of kind of nice. Again, it's a more expensive cane, but you know some people pay more for, for sneakers than the cane costs. So it, right. it really depends on the individual in that case. Thank you, Thank you Cher. Thank you. Thanks for bringing so it up. So it sounds kind of like a baseball player choking up on the bat. You can always make it shorter. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Well said. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So we have time for two more questions. Chris, I know you had a question. And then Kevin, I see you have your hand raised. And that'll have to be it because we are at our time. 
So uh, I'm uh, I'm trying to figure out uh, if I can uh, uh, come up with a kind of cane that'll be, that'll be good for me. I see a lot more than uh, some people. Uh, I don't usually run into uh, trees and things, but uh, I mean branches, of course, will still get you. But um, the uh, um, but but you know I can't. I'm not super reliable with seeing cars, and I can't go out if it's dark at all. And I can't go into a dark room or all that kind of junk, right? Because I just can't see anything in those cases. But but the but when I'm out walking around in the daytime, which I can do. I, I, I can generally find sidewalks and I can find the uh, darker area where the, if they have one, if there's a handicap, uh, you know, step down thing. Uh, and, but, but one thing I can basically never see are uh, the crosswalk lights. And so usually I can see the traffic lights because they're closer. And, you know, I, uh, I'm an old guy with sight for most of my life. So I know how intersections work. So that's, relatively safe but still sometimes uh, uh occasionally i just have to kind of go for it uh and uh and so i'm thinking that for chris, that's a good example of if i had a cane i could whip that out and then maybe uh people would uh you know what i'm saying yeah chris, you still have a 10 percent chance of getting hit with that so there's two things first of all training 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 it's technique and technology so before you pick the cane you need to get a little bit of training. Where do you live? Um, I'm over in Arlington. You're in Virginia. So yeah. DBVI has a very good, has a several really good trainers. Um, be in touch with them. And um, I am sure that Sean or someone at uh, POB can give you that contact information if you don't have it. They have some really nice trainers over there. And let one of the trained instructors measure you for a cane, talk to you about the different kinds, actually put them in your hands and let you try them and then show you how you cross. Now, down and dirty, there's a new app, okay? Don't depend on it at 100% because it's brand new and I don't know that it's 100% accurate, but it's called OKO, O-K-O. It's a free app and it will tell you which light is on on the crosswalk. And the nice thing about it for people who don't see and don't have dog guides, all right, is that when you're facing the light, it vibrates. And when you move away from the light, it vibrates slower. And when you're not facing the light at all, it stops vibrating. So it's just, you point your iPhone with this app towards the light and it will tell you when the crosswalk light, but get the training so you know when it's not right and when you shouldn't cross anyway. Yeah, learn the the audible uh, cues there. Yeah, the, the thing is, I, I I have really bad hearing as well. <laughs> oh, that complicates. Well, that's where the that's where the vibration was was built into this app will help you. Yeah. Um, but also, it's just learning about traffic patterns is very very important because it's not the same when you're sighted as when you have vision loss. Um, we're more careful with with a lot of things as far as crossings. Yeah. Okay. And Kevin's raising his hand over ahead, there. You, you promised him, Sean, he gave you the yeah. last one. <laughs> well, this has been a great session. I just wanted to chime in. I lost my sight when I was 55. I lost my sight in 2015. And I didn't use a cane probably for a year and a half. And I was going out with my then 84, 82-year-old mother her holding doors for me, and it was kind of embarrassing. So I was kind of happy to get a cane in my hand so that people knew why people were helping me or, you know, being able to get around better. Um, and getting that orientation training and mobility training has been invaluable. So I definitely recommend it to everyone. Thanks, um, <laughs> And one last thing, I would like to talk with you, um, you know, offline, but due to the fact that I've used a white cane and had an incident with my white cane, I created a product <laughs> that, to store my white cane in because I wanted something to put my cane in before I stuck it in my bag because I ran my cane through something nasty on the ground. Oh. So I have a product that I sell called the Cane Keeper, and that's for a folding cane that you use. So um, anyone interested, you know, contact me, look me up. 
Um, but find a way to get that orientation training and learn to use a cane. I still have some light sensitivity, but I can't see curves. So not wanting to fall and not having fell since losing my sight. I'm a little proud of myself about that. Well done. <laughs> well done. Awesome. Thank so you, Sean, Kevin. To close? Yes, and that was a perfect last statement as a recommendation and <laughs> about how great a cane is. So thank you, Kevin. Kevin, the check's in the mail. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't plant that, we promise. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, both Sharon and Dora Lynn, for presenting today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. The